Welcome to the Synthesis of Yoga podcast, the book that changed my life. It's always a great joy for me to dive deep into this book because every time I dive deep, I discover deeper riches, greater joy. Now we have reached the third chapter. In the first chapter, Sri Aurobindo has given us this broad picture of yoga as the yoga of nature. And we are her thinkers through which she is now accelerating her own evolution towards her own divine possibilities. And yoga is a way to accelerate and yoga utilizes powers of nature. And there is nothing mystical about yoga. Just like science uses forces of nature, yoga utilizes subjective psychological forces of nature and intensifies it and accelerates our evolution to manifest that which is latent. But yoga has to now rediscover itself to meet the requirements of the modern world and its challenges. So this book is setting out to really rediscover yoga and its essential purpose and the method suitable for the contemporary challenges of the world. In the second chapter, Sri Aurobindo gave an overview of the past evolutionary steps or rather three evolutionary steps of nature. In the past, the first step has been already very well established, the bodily life. Second step is the development of the mind on the ground of a bodily life. And this second step is an ongoing process of evolution. And nature is now spreading that mental capacity across the planet, making it a widespread ability among humanity. And third step is the spiritual dimension that has been demonstrated only here and there as an isolated case of prototypes. It is still awaits a large scale manifestation. So these are the three steps. Now the third chapter, the title is Threefold Life the threefold life. Previous chapter was three steps of nature. Now it is threefold life. In our life, there are these three folds, as Sri Aurobindo terms it. Now let's explore what these three folds are and what he is bringing in in this chapter. What is the new picture that he's painting? So this is our episode number 11. And make sure that you have the text with you so that you can follow the lines as we dive deeper into it and you can enjoy it more. And it is understanding these lines and their deep structures and their deep content that leaves the imprint and makes the necessary inner shift. So let's begin. Nature, then, is an evolution or progressive self-manifestation of an eternal and secret existence with three successive forms as her three steps of ascent. This is just the gist of the previous chapter we are leaving behind. Evolution is a progressive self-manifestation. Self, each one of us have self, that is our individual self. Behind that individual self, there is a universal self. And behind and beyond that universal self, there is a transcendent self. It's one self. That self is manifesting itself in the material world. Matter can be seen as the medium of this artist who is behind, who is expressing himself through this material medium, through 
nature. That's the picture Sri Aurobindo has given us. So it's a progressive self-manifestation. It is not that in one go everything is expressed. It is progressive. That's where evolution comes into the picture. In evolution, everything is moving from simple to complex. There is an evolutionary unfolding. There is a progressive manifestation. Nature then is an evolution or progressive self-manifestation of an eternal and secret existence. Eternal and secret existence. Our individual body and bodily life dissolves within a lifespan of, let's say, maximum 100 years. But there is something that is eternal. And that eternal is common to all. That self is eternal and secret and veiled. So it's a secret existence. That eternal self is a secret existence. We live on the front end, surface layers of our being, in our body, in our emotions, in our mind, which is only the surface. Behind it is the secret self that is manifesting itself progressively through us, through nature, its secret purpose, its vision, its dreams. And this is expressing itself with three successive forms as her three steps of ascent, nature's ascension into her own spiritual glory. There are three successive steps involved in it. Let's move on. As we have, consequently, as the condition of all our activities, these three mutually interdependent possibilities, the bodily life, the mental existence, the veiled and the veiled spiritual being, which is in the involution the cause of the others and in the evolution, their result. We have two very interesting words here, involution and evolution. Evolution is quite familiar. Our technologies are evolving rapidly. Mobile phone we can see is evolving rapidly. Now artificial intelligence has emerged and it is rapidly evolving. And when we look back into the past, we see there is a long historic process of evolution, evolution of the species on Earth over millions and millions of years. That's the process of evolution. There is a progressive evolution moving towards more and more complex forms, complex expressions, complex harmony. But what is involution? Is that this word is something very central to Sri Aurobindo's teachings. Here, the idea is what is evolving has been already involved in the material substance. Say, imagine it's something like this, a tree. It's a full-fledged tree. If you consider the growth and emergence of a tree as the process of evolution, now that tree can compress itself and put itself into a seed. Now, the tree is involved in the seed as a latent potential. Seed is so small in which the tree is latent. It's an involved potential. And when it is in the right condition, in time and space, out of that seed, the tree can evolve. So there is an involution, there is an evolution, two processes. Even in our cosmic process of evolution, according to the yogic perspective, the spirit is already involved in the very material substratum of our existence. It is out of that life is emerging, out of life mind is emerging, out of mind spirit would emerge because spirit was already involved in it. Spirit was the cause of this creation and also it is the spirit 
the goal towards which evolution is tending. That's what he is saying here. The veiled spiritual being, which is in the evolution, the cause of the others, and in the evolution, their result. So we have these three successive steps of ascent. And we have consequently, as the condition of all our activities, all that we do in our daily routine, as well as our long-term plans of our individual life and our social and collective evolution, the conditions of all our activities, these three mutually interdependent possibilities. These, th these three steps of evolution, the bodily life, the mind, the spirit, these three are interdependent possibilities. So they lay the, down the condition for everything we do. Spirit, even when it is not visibly manifest, it is still pushing things from behind the scene. It is influencing. Mind, which is an ongoing process of evolution, it is influencing. Bodily life is the established condition which is influencing. And they are mutually interdependent. Three mutually interdependent possibilities. The bodily life, the mental existence, and the veiled spiritual being. Now, this spiritual being is in the evolu involution, involution, remember the word, involution, is the cause of others. It is because it has involved, it is that which has caused the emergence of this evolutionary process where bodily life has emerged and then the mind has emerged. It's the cause of others and in the evolution, their result this eventual process of evolution would result in the rediscovery of the spirit in the material medium through which this cosmic artist is working itself out for the spiritual self-expression in time and space. Next line. Preserving and perfecting the physical fulfilling the mental. It is nature's aim and it should be ours to unveil in the perfected body and mind the transcendent activities of the spirit. Preserving and perfecting the physical. So the physical has to be preserved and perfected. Now, preservability of our physical bodily existence is quite limited. There is a bodily lifespan that is, let's say, maximum 100 years. Even within that, after 50s, there is body beginning to degenerate. We can Now, scientists are trying to extend the lifespan, healthy lifespan, beyond our current possibilities. So there is an instinct in nature to preserve this instinct. Currently, nature is doing it as self-multiplication, self-repetition, self-reproduction through which the material immortality is retained. We are continuously reproducing ourselves because our bodily life has its limitation. But the innate instinct there is to preserve. Now that instinct, when it become conscious in our modern human scientific endeavor, for example, it become the search for extending the lifespan, a healthy lifespan, so that the body can be preserved longer and longer. This life activities can be continued longer and longer and not suffering from decay, disease, and death. So there is an urge towards preserving the body and perfecting the physical. The physical itself has its evolutionary journey. Body is not yet perfect. It cannot express freely. It cannot open itself freely to 
receive new capacities. For example, our bodily learning capacity gets limited by the time we cross our 40s. So if we want to learn a new sports, it becomes more and more difficult because the body becomes more and more rigid as we age. So our learning capacity within the body is limited and there is an imperfection of the body. And body has to spend one third of its lifetime in sleep in order to regenerate itself then constantly feed itself with all kinds of food so that it can sustain and as a result all kinds of diseases and challenges that comes with it. Body as it is now is highly imperfect and we are not able to preserve it. So one of the aim is preserving and perfecting the physical. That's at a physical level. Fulfilling the mental mind Fulfillment of the mind. What is the fulfillment of the mind? Mind is searching for more and more perfect knowledge, more and more comprehensive knowledge. Mind is struggling from ignorance and piecing together little pieces of knowledge and making bigger and bigger pictures of knowledge. So fulfillment of knowledge, the growth into cosmic knowledge, all comprehensive integral knowledge that's the journey of the mind to fulfill itself so fulfilling the mental it is nature's aim and this is we think it is our aim it is not our aim it is nature's aim working through us and we feel ourselves as it is our drive our curiosity our own thirst to know it is nature's thirst and purpose. There is a mental aim, there is a bodily aim, physical aim. And it should be ours to unveil in the perfected body and mind the transcendent activities of the spirit. So once we become conscious of nature's larger impulsion towards her own spiritual reality, naturally, it must be our aim as well to unveil the spiritual in the perfected bodily and mental life. So it should be ours to unveil in the perfected body and mind the transcendent activities of the spirit. Spirit is involved here and it is involved in the individual, it is involved in the collective, it is involved in the universal. It is also transcendent, that transcendent spirit beyond time and space expressing itself in time and space in the material medium. That is the possibility we have as an evolutionary journey ahead of us. Next line, as the mental life does not abrogate but works for the elevation and better utilization of the bodily existence, so too the spiritual should not abrogate, but transfigure our intellectual, emotional, aesthetic and vital activities. As the mental life does not abrogate, abrogate is to evade, to avoid. As the mental life does not abrogate but works for the elevation and better utilization of the bodily existence. What does it mean? Mental life does not abrogate but works for the elevation and better utilization of the bodily existence. Our normal bodily existence is concerned about its self-preservation. And so regular feeding of the body, comforts of the body, health of the body, fitness of the body. So the regular routine activities of our bodily life individually and collectively. So at a collective level, the reason why we do all our <clears throat> 
farming, production of food and food distribution, preparation of the food, feeding of the food and the whole economic system that supports <coughs> the entire activity of sustaining the life of the people. The food, the housing, the clothing, the basics of sustenance of life of the people. And we can see the scientific knowledge converted itself into modern technologies to aid in every field of human activities to make it easy to support whether it is farming or any kinds of modern economic activities that supports our life. So the mental life that is seeking knowledge, we can see the mental life as the mental the uh, mental evolution the new cycle that began in europe with the emergence of modern science searching for knowledge of the material world and converting that into technologies that supports life and that's the greatest impact scientific knowledge has in our everyday life through technologies it is able to support bodily life. So the entire consumerism is a natural byproduct of that provision of science and technology creating its products and services to serve bodily life and its needs. Now we are not discussing the consequence of the current consumerist culture but just observing the fact that the evolution of the mind, rational intelligence gathering its more and more comprehensive knowledge is applying that knowledge to make bodily life more and more easy. So there is this material development. When we say a developed nation, we are largely referring to materially, economically and intellectually developed nation. And as the mental life does not abrogate but works for the elevation and better utilization of the bodily life. So there is an attempt to elevate the bodily life itself to finer and refined life. So too, the spiritual should not abrogate but transfigure our intellectual, emotional, aesthetic and vital activities. So just like the mental evolution and mental life is not abrogating the bodily life, so too the spiritual growth when it emerges, it should not abrogate the mental life nor the bodily life. It has to transfigure and transform our intellectual, emotional, aesthetic and vital activities. These two steps of evolutionary ascent, the bodily life and the mental evolution, these are not to be rejected but evaded, but it has to embrace them and transfigure them. And that is the work that is ahead. And there is a reason why he is bringing in this particular point because there had been an attempt in the spiritual growth to evade, to abrogate the bodily life and mental culture, to shoot upward into the dissolution, into the spirit, denying the bodily life and mental life. So that's what we will be exploring further in this chapter. So he is laying the ground for it. So the mind did not abrogate bodily life. So the spirit should not abrogate neither the mental fulfillment nor the bodily fulfillment. The next line. For man, the head of terrestrial nature, the sole earthly frame in which her full evolution is possible is a triple birth. Another very interesting phrase. Triple birth. Man, the head of terrestrial nature. 
head of terrestrial nature. If we imagine the whole nature in the metaphor of a human body, then man is the head, head of the terrestrial nature. That's one way to understand it. Another way to understand it is nature had been building up various life forms and there is an evolutionary ascension. It is only when the man emerged, the mental evolution became possible. And it is the latest version of her evolutionary journey, her latest product. Therefore, he is the head of terrestrial nature. Youngest, but the latest version. Therefore, the most complex, most rich in its possibilities, most capable in her evolutionary emergence. So for man, the head of terrestrial nature, the sole earthly frame in which her full evolution is possible. So it is in this human bodily frame, her full evolution is possible. Nature has come up with all kinds of body frames, life forms. They are frameworks, whether it is an elephant, a whale, a dolphin, or any other life forms, a monkey, a chimpanzee, all these are bodily frames, material frames in which life has emerged. But it is in man who is the sole earthly frame in which her full evolution is possible. In other life forms, her full evolution is not possible. Even just looking at the mental evolution, mental culture that we have found expression in our collective life, collective existence, in other life forms, we do not find that kind of freedom and creativity, the pure creativity. Even when we see there are other animals having very fine empathic capacities like dolphin. Bodily structure, the material frame, even if we look at, compare our hands, our bodily hand and its creative possibility, compare that with the fins of a dolphin, what it can do in terms of material creation. The human version of the bodily life, this particular prototype, this particular species is the most capable and therefore the sole earthly frame in which her full evolution is possible. A partial evolution is already accomplished in other life forms. The full evolution is possible. It is in the human bodily frame with its brain and nervous system and limbs that are highly capable of creative expressions. We are tool makers. Our body itself is one of the most complex tools in nature. And it is within the human body, her, her is she, the nature, her full evolution is possible. And this human being is a triple birth. What is this triple birth? We will be exploring it in these coming lines. He has been given a living frame in which the body is the vessel and life the dynamic means of a divine manifestation. Now that is the first birth. When you are born, you get a living frame in which the body is the vessel and life the dynamic means of a divine manifestation. So the double layer, there is a material body and the life energy animating the material body. These two layers, the sthula sharira, which we mentioned in the previous chapter, sthula sharira, annamaya, and pranamaya together forms the sthula sharira. These are the two layers. So the body is the vessel and the life, the dynamic means, life energy, the prana shakti, the vital force, 
that animates it brings the dynamic possibilities dynamic means it energizes activates we are able to do what we do because of the dynamic force of life energy working in this material frame so that is the first birth he has been given a living frame in which the body is the vessel and life the dynamic means of a divine manifestation. So the divine manifestation is awaiting for the evolution. So the first birth is the bodily life. The next, his activity is centered in a progressive mind which aims at perfecting itself as well as the house in which it dwells as the means of life that it uses and is capable of awaking by a progressive self-realization to its own true nature as a form of the spirit. That's the next birth. His activity is centered in a progressive mind. Centered. So there is a bodily vessel, bodily frame, and it is being animated by life force. And together it is the Stula Sadira. But the activity is finding expression through this Stula Sharira is centered in the Sukshma Sharira, which is the progressive mind unfolding. The center of our activity is in the mind. We are mental beings. Therefore, we are called man. Man, not in the sense of a gender, but man, man, mind, manas. Manas is Sanskrit word. And even Sanskrit word for human being is manushya. Man, manas, man, mind. Mind is what makes us human beings. That is our unique faculty that has rapidly emerged. That's what we are mental beings capable of that progressive journey with the mind. His activity is centered in a progressive mind. Mind is progressive compared to bodily life. Animals go round and round in their routines. Whereas human mind is curious, it is progressive. It wants to search and find greater and greater knowledge. Progressive mind which aims at perfecting itself. Mind is not satisfied with its limited knowledge, its limited capacities. It wants to perfect itself. So which aims at perfecting itself as well as the house in which it dwells. What is the house in which it is dwelling? It is the bodily frame. So this bodily frame has to be perfected. It is imperfect, as we mentioned before. Old age, disease, death, this is not acceptable. So the mind strives to perfect itself. And the house where it is dwelling, we don't experience body as a house in which one is dwelling. We experience identified with the body, I am the body. But from a spiritual point of view, you are looking at, it's a house in which you are dwelling. And the means of life it uses. So the mind uses all the means of life that it provides. And we want to perfect all the means of life. We want to perfect because that's the nature of the mind and is capable of awaking by a progressive self-realization. Capable of awaking by a progressive self-realization. When the mind begins to question, who am I? Why am I doing this? What is the purpose of this activity? What is the purpose of life? That very question, the inquiry, that's where the progressive self-realization starts. The inquiry into who am I? 
and why I do what I do, what motivates me, from where is the motive impulsion is arising, who is the cause, as the Kena Upanishad would say, who is the seer behind seeing, the one who is the hearer behind hearing, who projected the thought, who projected the perception. So going back into who am I, that progressive self-realization to its own true nature as a form of the spirit. I am a form of the spirit. There is this eternal, secret, timeless self behind. I am a form, a form through which that eternal, timeless spirit is expressing itself. That is the self-realization. The self-realization is not just my self as a separate self, but the self that is behind entire existence. So it is capable, the human mind is capable of awaking by a progressive self-realization to its own nature, own true nature as a form of the spirit. Let me read this line once again. His activity is centered in a progressive mind, which aims at perfecting itself as well as the house in which it dwells and the means of life that it uses. See, it's a very clear structure. You can see structural dimension where he is saying going from mind, body, life. Aims at perfecting itself as well as the house in which it dwells as the means and the means of life that it uses and is capable of awaking by a progressive self-realization to its own true nature as a form of the spirit. Next line. He culminates in what he always was the illumined and beatific spirit, which is intended at last to irradiate life and mind with its own, with its now concealed splendors. That is the culmination. He culminates in what he always really was. We are always that spirit, but we are not aware of it. We were that, we are it, we will be that. So he culminates in what he always really was. And what was that? The illumined and beatific spirit. Illumined. Its very nature is of light. Illumination and beatific. All beautiful. Beauty, harmony, delight, all these are native to spirit. The illumined and beatific spirit, which is intended at last to irradiate life and mind with its now concealed splendors. So there is an intention in nature to bring in the radiance of the spirit into life and mind bring out that concealed splendors of the spirit and irradiate life and mind with its now concealed splendors. So that is the intention of nature and the spirit behind nature to irradiate into life, into mind, the concealed splendors. Since this is the plan, of the divine energy in humanity. Energy here is capital E, indicating it is that large cosmic energy, divine Shakti. Since this is the plan of the divine energy in humanity, the whole method and aim of our existence must work by the interaction of these three elements of the being. What are the three elements of the being? The bodily life, the progressive mind, and the spirit. 
since this is the plan of the divine energy in humanity, the whole method and aim of our existence, the method and aim. We need to distinguish between the two. One is the aim of life. Aim of life is to be seen as that progressive self-manifestation through an evolutionary process. To irradiate the splendors of the spirit into mind, into life, into this material existence. That's the very aim of it. And so must be the method as well. The whole method and aim of our existence must work by the interaction of these three elements of the being, these three elements. So the bodily life, progressive mind, and the concealed spirit, it is their interaction must be the method. The whole method and aim of our existence mu must work by the interaction of these three elements. So, concealed spirit, progressive mind and bodily life must interact in order to fulfill our bodily aim and even the right method of its fulfillment, these three must come together. As a result of these separate formulation in nature, man has opened to him the choice between three kinds of life. The ordinary material life, a life of mental activity and progress, and the unending, unchanging spiritual beatitude. So three kinds of life are possible for us. And this is possible because of the separate formulation of these three steps of nature the bodily life, progressive mind, and concealed spirit. These are three separate formulations. As a result of their separate formulation in nature, man has opened to him a choice between three kinds of life. What is that? The ordinary material existence. That's where we start, the very first birth. Second is a life of mental activity and progress. That is the second birth. Third is the unchanging spiritual beatitude, the spiritual self-realization and a life from that poise. These are the three options that are available, three kinds of life. Ordinary material existence, life of mental activity and progress, and the unchanging spiritual beatitude. So we know the great spiritual masters like Buddha, Ramana Maharshi, Sri Aurobindo, they, they have shown to us what it means to live in the spirit. Living embodied examples, but rare. Vast majority live in the mental activity and or not vast majority. Vast majority live in the ordinary material existence. In between is the rapidly evolving cream of humanity living in the mind, mental, progressive journey where mind is rapidly gathering more and more complex and rich knowledge and transforming life. And all three are possible and there is these three layers of humanity of which bodily life is the most common, largest chunk of humanity, a small set is living in this progressive mind and still a tiny fraction lives in the unchanging spiritual beatitude. So these are the three kinds of life that is possible and they simultaneously exist. And each individual has these three elements interacting. And for our individual evolution as well as collective evolution, all three must come together. But he can, as he progresses, combine these three forms, resolve their discords into a harmonious rhythm, and so create in himself the Godhead, the perfect man. So, we as we evolve, 
when he is referring to us, he is referring to the mankind, the human being. As he can, as he progresses, combine these three forms. Bodily life can be combined with progressive mind, which can be combined with the self-existent spiritual beatitude and its splendors. So combination of the three, combine these three forms, resolve their discords into harmonious rhythm. They need not be in harmony and that's our current state of affairs. There is a conflict between mind and body. There is also a conflict between mind and spirit and spirit and bodily life. There is a discord which can be resolved, which has to be resolved. Combine these three forms and resolve their discords into a harmonious rhythm. And so creating himself the whole Godhead, the perfect man. So in order to create the perfect man, this conflict between, the discord between, disharmony between these three layers, these three steps of nature, these three movements of our evolutionary nature must come together. So when a spiritual seeker renounces and rejects bodily life, what we are seeing is that discord, unwillingness to accept bodily life and its complexity. When the mind, the progressive mind, rejects spirituality as a hallucination, an unscientific superstition, there is no evidence for it because its progressive mind is unable to grasp what that is. We are looking at another fracture, a disharmony, a discord. But fortunately, we see in today's world, there is a growing recognition. So science and spirituality conferences and meetings are coming together. It's a good sign. And yogins and monks are collaborating with the scientists to study objectively what is this inner process, inner journey, and what are the material consequences, what are these inner capacities, as well as. So the application of all this into the bodily life by developing technologies that is helping in meditation, in inner journey, all that is a sign of collaboration of these three coming together because the progressive mind embraces life through its technologies and upliftment of the humanity through all these means. And spirit brings the deeper meaning and purpose to the collective life. So it is when these three come together, the perfect man can be born, the whole Godhead, the perfect man can be born. So, but he can, as he progresses, combine these three forms, resolve their discords into a harmonious rhythm and so create in himself the whole Godhead, the perfect man. So we can see this journey of our collective human life where various schools of thought and bodies of knowledge the spiritual knowledge is one vast body of knowledge. Scientific knowledge is another vast body of knowledge. They're still living as two different compartments. They have to now marry and come together, complement each other so that the bodily life can be taken up and brought out. What is to be brought out? The divine in human nature, the Godhead within. The perfect man can be brought out. So with that, let's end today's session. And please make sure that you subscribe to this channel so that you get notifications. Click on the bell icon so that you can get the notification. And uh, do share your suggestions for improvement and post your comments. That will be of great value. See you next Wednesday, 6 a.m. Thank you.